coming up. If they're saying no, I guess I just don't know what anyone wants. I can just write what I want to see. Leaning into just writing what I wanted to see and really being excited about no one wanting to see it is where this sense of authenticity came from because it made me really feel unafraid of a no. Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make a micro-budget feature, submit your film or screenplay now at filmfreeway.com slash studiofest. This series exists in both video and podcast form and is designed to be experienced either way. You can find the video version at moviemaker.com or the audio version wherever you get your podcasts. From Studio Fest and Movie Maker Magazine, this is Demystified, a series about an innovative new way to make movies and what it really takes to make an indie feature film. My name is Jake Bowen, and this series is about shedding light on the parts of getting an indie film made that are never seen and rarely talked about through the lens of Studio Fest, a -a one-of-a-kind annual film festival that awards up-and-coming writers and directors the chance to make a feature film. So far in our interview episodes, our guests have been directors and writer-directors, but we haven't yet spoken to someone who's known first and foremost as a writer. When we asked Lua Meyasu, the winning writer from Studio Fest 2019, who she'd like to interview if she ever got the chance, the top of her list was playwright, actor, and screenwriter Jeremy O. Harris, writer of the Tony Award-nominated Broadway show Slave Play, and writer of the new movie Zola. From here on out, watch every move this bitch makes. This is messy. You are messy. Your brain is broke. Zola, directed by Janixa Bravo, is in theaters right now. But Jeremy sat down to speak with Luam just ahead of the film's release, which gives us a little window into the mind of a creative right on the cusp of his creation entering into the world. So here's Luam's conversation with Jeremy O. Harris. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm okay, a little tired. I was so anxious about today that I like didn't sleep last night. Oh, really? Yeah, I think it's because I knew reviews were coming out and like, it's the day, you know? Yeah, it's the day. Well, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Of course, thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to share this time with you. I'm here on behalf of Movie Maker Magazine and Studio Fest, and I was their screenwriting winner. And I'm here making my first feature as well with Studio Fest. That is sick. What's your first feature called? I love titles. I'm a title whore. Right now it's called The Ticket. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's like a dystopian comedy. It's pretty exciting. You were first on my list. I never thought we'd get you, but That's here you are. Insane. Oh my <laughs> God. This is so cool. cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. When I first started writing, I didn't look at screenwriters. I looked at a lot of playwrights because I have like a huge theater background. So my writing's really heavily influenced by playwrights. Being a playwright yourself, what was the transition like coming from playwriting into screenwriting? Like, what did that look like for you? Well, it's really funny because I sort of tried to learn screenwriting concurrently with trying to learn playwriting because I was an actor first and I was an actor in drama school, but I had a very dense knowledge of the theater canon because of my high school theater program. So I knew how plays were written, what they looked like on the page, how they flowed. I knew the language of playwriting. I only knew cinema through having watched a lot of movies. Um, And so when I first moved to LA and decided that I didn't want people to know me as an actor because I was not getting work and it was easier for people to know me as a writer um, because I'd written a play in college that got published. And so I was like, I'll just tell people I'm a writer. If I tell people I'm a playwright, I feel even better about that. Um, (laughs) I realized that I wanted to study screenwriting as much as I studied playwriting because girls had just come out and I was so obsessed with girls. And I was like, I think I can do this. There was like the first time I had this tangible thing in front of me that I was like, this is the type of making I can and should do. So I went to this website that had all of these screenplays on it. And I started reading the canon of screenplays. And then I got addicted to the blacklist because that started around the same time I first moved here. And I started reading all these blacklist screenplays. I'm saying all this to say that like, I learned how to finish a play first because I had read more plays, I had been in more plays than I had been in or read of films. And it took me about seven years of reading screenplays and trying to finish them 
before I could ever have the confidence to start endeavoring something like Zola, which is my first ever screenplay with Janixa. Did you have any apprehension moving into TV and film, like when you got Zola? Yeah, I mean, I think because I had written a pilot that I was really proud of and like, it didn't like go so well around the city. Um, and I realized how much of like the notes process in Hollywood is based less on like interiority or specificity sometimes and more about what's hot and like what people can like legibly see will sell. I was really disheartened about like the possibilities of what I could bring to something like Zola. Cause I was like, hey, Janixa, like you already as a storyteller are really left of center. Like I'm not really like a pop star either. It's not like we're gonna like make something that's gonna sit in the middle because you're gonna pull me one way and I'm gonna pull you the other way. And she was basically just like, oh, no, no, no. I want this to be like a Bernie AOC meetup. Like, this is like full experimentation, full all the way to the left. Like, we don't need to go to the middle at all. And that was what was really exciting about working with her um, on this one and made me alleviate some of that fear that I was going to fail miserably at giving people the pop script that I think that I projected people wanted from Azola. Absolutely. Yeah, I understand that. It's like a very arduous thing to think that you have to write something that somebody thinks they want, you know, you want to see. So with that being said, I, I saw Slave Play in New York City. Oh, my God. And it was amazing. But I just, you know, being who you are and listening to your interviews and reading your articles. And um, I think I first heard you on Keep It, the podcast. <laughs> Um, and you're just, you're so authentic to who you are as a person and it shows up so clearly in your work. And in this industry, we're always told as creatives, find your voice, find your voice, find your uniqueness, what makes you unique. And I think you have such a hold on that. So I wanted to know what that process looked like for you and how do you stay so authentic to yourself, especially in this industry that can kind of break you down a little bit. I think that authenticity for me is more based on like naivety. Being someone who's very naive to like the pressures of this industry early on, but so many people had said no to so many things. And I was just sort of like, well, fuck it. Like they're saying, no, I guess I just don't know what anyone wants. I can just write what I want to see. And I think leaning into just writing what I wanted to see um, and really being excited about no one wanting to see it is where the sense of authenticity came from. Um, because it made me really feel unafraid of a no like knowing that the no is probably going to come made me really unafraid of a no um and I think now I'm in this really interesting moment now that people have said yes and said like really loudly yes 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 more 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 and and that's like changed my family's life that's changed my life like on a financial level now I'm trying to find out how to maintain that same fuck it voice and that same honesty um, while also knowing that like I'm taking care of my family and my three nieces and nephews and have like dreams of being someone that can like be a provider um, that feel tangible and wondering if those things are in conflict with me being authentic to myself. But I think before it was like feeling like the no was going to come no matter what and just living in that. And now it's more so coming back to that place and finding some new mode of the fuck it. What does Jeremy want to see place? Right. And so like, it's so easy to say yes to it all, I would imagine. So how do you, how do you create boundaries for yourself? Like what makes you want to choose a project and keep your boundaries up for other projects that you don't feel authentic to? Well, I feel very, very, very lucky because, you know, I'm working on three studio movies right now. And each of those studio movies came to me because of friendship first. So one of those things was a movie with an actor that I admire so much who met me my third year at Yale and wanted me to write something with him. And so me, him, his producing partner, and my best friend, who's now my producing partner, all came up with this crazy idea in a hotel at Yale that I really loved that I haven't finished. And that if they hear me on this podcast, I can be like, where is it, sir? <laughs> um, and that was really amazing, you know, because I feel like when I'm working on that, I'm working with family and the pressures of deadlines feel very far away from it. I'm working on a, a adaptation of a graphic novel by Ailish Coat. Ailish and our producer Tamir met me um, right when I was doing Daddy and I read the graphic novel and I fell for it so completely. And I was like, I see it in three dimensions. I know how to do this. 
And that made that really easy um, to say yes. And with the other one, I'm working with Janixa. Janixa and I have another project together and she's my like my big sister, you know? And I think that for me, what I'm trying to get to a place of is like, um, if, if all of these things were just being made with those three people, I'd feel so comfortable being like, here's my draft. But I think there's also a part of me that has a sense of failure and the sense of hearing like studio system and what that means and having friends who've been fired from jobs and replaced. And I don't want these things I love to like have someone else's names on them. Um, that like, I'm trying to get over that hump of fearing failure and saying like, no, I, there's no way I can fail because like, I don't care. Because when I wrote Slave Play, I wasn't writing it to go to Broadway. I was writing it to go to like the smallest theater in New York. So I didn't have to worry about what someone on Broadway would think about it. But now I know that I'm working on films that are gonna have like $20 million budgets or more maybe. And so there's a certain audience they're gonna want for that. And that makes me nervous about what notes I'm gonna get when I turn in the draft. Because that's so much emotional labor, right? You know this, navigating the notes process is emotional labor. Because a lot of time notes are probably great, but when you've already committed to falling in love with an idea and it's become real in your head, it's like punching a hole in a universe, you know, to change it. Yeah, I have to really rev up for notes when I know they're coming back because it can be, you fall in love with these characters in the story and you know that like, there's gonna be blood all over that script. Yes. <laughs> so you have to prepare for that. Um, do you feel more, cause I started off as an actor as well and I still am an actor, but I do call, because screenwriting is taking off more, I do call myself more a writer sometimes yes. because of what you had just said. Do you feel more comfortable calling yourself a performer now? I feel more comfortable calling myself an artist because I think that like, you know, feeling limitless inside of the form or the space of culture is where I feel um, the most power and feeling like I can say, you know what, I think this year I just want to produce and feeling really okay with that and feeling really okay with the fact that like, I know I'm a really good reader. I ask really good questions to people and I'm super supportive, like um, means that like, sometimes I just want to do that instead of focusing on like output. And like, if I get remembered as someone late, like further down the line who just like, supported other people's work more than I like a uh, produced my own like the I made output that would feel great for me too because to be a caretaker is something I think is really undervalued um the same is true of being someone who is a vessel right and I think I really enjoy the process of being a vessel especially in things that are made by artists who I admire who I don't think I could emulate on the page right there's a lot of people I could pretend to be but I don't think I could pretend to be Darren Starr I don't know how to pretend to be Joshua Saffron because my brain doesn't have that same uh, sense of structure that I think the people who write really delicious got to get to the next episode bingeable television do, you know? And that's why, I, you know, Gossip Girl was the show I grew up on. Sex and City was the show I grew up on. So when I got the opportunity to be on Emily in Paris and the new Gossip Girl, I was like, oh, absolutely. I want to learn from these people and be a vessel to see what I can learn living inside of a universe that's very different than the ones I craft. So switching gears to collaboration, you said that Janexa is like your older sister. So what was collaborating with her like? Because I know it can be a growing pain when you're used to writing your own stuff and producing your own stuff. So what growing pains did you guys have and how did you have to adjust to collaborating? Well, you know, I definitely cried a lot. I'm sure she did too, but she would never show me that she cried. <laughs> She's a director and directors don't cry in front of people. But it was really tough, you know, because our processes are very different, even if our sensibilities are so the same. Like, I'm a Gemini, and I'm a sort of like, my first idea is the genius idea type <laughs> of writer, and she's not. She's a Pisces, and she's very, she thinks through every idea she's going to have um, really, really hard, and she has to see it play out on the page. So that takes, that means that there'll be certain scenes where I'm like, I think this is it. And she's like, it's not. I don't know why, but like, let's see it like this. Let's see it like this. And by the end of the time, we've seen it like 70 different ways. And then she goes back, she's like, I think it's way 25 is the way. You know, and she's a no stone left unturned type of person. She's very meticulous. And I learned so much from that level of um, detail, you know? And I think she challenged me a lot to be detail oriented in ways I hadn't before. Um, in ways that were so informative to me and taught me so much about the kind of screenwriter I'm going to be going forward. 
because it makes it easier to step into that notes process when you're like, I can defend everything because I can tell you what would happen if we did it that way. Because we already did. If you want to see that draft, it's draft number, it's goldenrod draft, you know, draft like sapphire, you know. I find that I, I give up the things that I'm not as strong at to somebody else who might be stronger. Like it's, and it can be difficult to give your ego away, you know, but that's, that's the process of collaboration. When you do, you're like, oh yeah, actually this idea was much better than the one I had. Okay. I get it now, you know? Yes. Uh, and I think that there were also things, you know, one of the big growing pains for me were figuring out the compromises one has to make as an independent filmmaker compared to the filmmaker I imagined, right? Because like we see these romanticized versions of filmmakers in films and like we read about the ones we love in movies. And very often they don't talk about the strife, the strife of being an independent filmmaker, right? Who wants to do ambitious things. And I think that when people find out our budget and the fact that we shot on film on location in Tampa, they're gonna realize why certain things are really hard. Because I'd be like, this scene has to happen this way in the car on this day, blah, blah, blah. And Janixa would just be like, Jeremy, I hear that on a narrative level, on an art level, but we have to figure out a new way to do it because the practicalities of what we're doing is that we're shooting this many days on this budget and we're shooting on film. And so if we're doing all that, we need to reframe the scene so we can have the same effect, but you know, $500,000 cheaper. And I think I just never had to think that way. Because in the theater, if I want us to go to London, Paris, Milan, and then the moon, that can happen in me just writing a stage direction. That happening in film is very difficult. But like how hands-on were you able to be in Zola versus slave pay, like behind the scenes, you know? It's a very different process, I, I'm assuming. Um, yeah. So yeah, how, what was your role like as a writer behind the scenes for Zola? Well, I mean, this is a bit incongruous, but it's how I think of the world and, and vibes. The best way to describe being a playwright is that you're like a switch dom. And like, because I think about everything in sexual dynamics, it's just like <laughs> how it works. Um, so a switch is someone who's versed. They like can be dom and submissive. Um, but if you're a switch dom, that means you're generally the dom, but you switch out and like switch out powers. Whereas in um, uh, screenwriting, you're a switch sub, right, to the director, unless you're directing it yourself. And, right. and, and that's a very different sensibility to have to hold on to. Like in the theater world, if a director says, I think you should change this, it's an I think you should. It's not a you're changing this. In the film world if the director's like we're changing this you're changing this it's not a like well you might have to change it and I think that like that change in sensibilities was like a bit hard that like sort of relinquishing of agency was a bit hard until I realized the power that there is in that I'm giving what I want to give to this process or what I need to give to this process fully um but like all of the pressure is off of me because every decision is the director's all the like critique and praise is going to come down on them and then when people finally trickle down to talking about the screenplay I might get a bit of that shine um but it won't have every decision won't matter every one decision won't rest on my shoulders whereas in the theater when people don't like some, something about slave play they don't like it because of Jeremy O. Harris so I wrote that it was happening and I allowed it to happen and the playwright is the king in that space yeah, totally. I feel like even as a theater actor, there's collaboration from opening to closing. Yeah. And I like with with screen and film, it's very heavy in the beginning and development and all of that. And then once shooting starts or it's wrapped, it's just like screenwriters out and it's all on the director now. Yeah. Um, so and just the editor, I mean, oh, sorry. I was going to say in our process, because of the way we worked with our editor, I truly feel like our editor is our third co-writer. Um, Joy McMillan. She's a genius. And, you know, so much of that process, I mean, I'm still in grad school while we're editing the movie. I'm like fully in like a different modality than everyone else. Um, so I couldn't be in the edit booth with them every week, but I went for a spring break and I was there. And it was really amazing to see how many ideas that we had got shifted and like made deeper by the process of editing and how often that gets discredited as a part of the writing process. So you're in grad school while all this is happening. Did you imagine that it was going to be this big? Or were you just like, what the fuck am I getting into? <laughs> I 
I definitely didn't imagine that it was going to be as big as it's feeling like it might become right now. I mean, again, we're in a bit of a time machine. I don't know when people are going to listen to this. So by the time they listen to it, it's either flopped or it's become a box office smash or it's somewhere in the middle. But where I'm sitting now, it's I didn't think that I'd be on the cover of The Hollywood Reporter because of it, right? Or that someone would have our name on some list about like Oscars. Like that was not the thought process when I was saying like, I see this movie being like, a mix of the Odyssey and Sula. Or when I was telling my friend Sam, who was like, Jeremy, just like when you get weird notes, just think like they just want it to be pop. And I was like, I can't write pop. This isn't Beyonce, this is Solange. Like that <laughs> that version of the thing was so far away from where we are now that I can't really process it, but I'm exhilarated at the opportunity that more eyes will see this than anything else I've ever written. And that's the really cool thing. Like whether people keep loving the movie or whether the movie goes through award stuff or not, I know that like my cousins in Virginia who are all working class or, you know, basically riding the poverty line, folks in the South are all going to be able to watch this movie on demand or at the theater and know that their cousin like is quote unquote doing big things. And that's really cool because they like no one understood Broadway except for my mom. Everyone understands the movie. That's so cool. That's such yeah. a great, great feeling. So just a fun question for me, because I, I want to know, what play would you adapt into a film? Oh, <laughs> so many, so many. I would say Adrian Kennedy's Funny House of the Negro, because that feels like the best thriller that hasn't been adapted. Mm. I would do The Goat or Who is Sylvia. <laughs> Wait, why aren't you? I don't know. I mean, I have to get the rights, but eventually, eventually, mostly just because I need to see that plate throwing scene on film, you know, <laughs> you have to do it. That's I, so good. I mean, yeah. his film, his, his work works so well as film. Well, I just, I want to say thank you for taking the time to do this as like somebody who owes her life to theater. I just, I'm so grateful that you keep fighting for it in the way that you do. And it's just, it's been so nice to share this space with you. You serve as a huge expander for me. So I'm really, I'm really grateful. That's so kind of you. And you have been so gracious and funny and ask amazing questions. So thank you. Thank um, you. Are you still having anxiety? I am still having anxiety, but I think I'm gonna try to take a 30 minute nap. Well, I'm a Reiki practitioner. Up. Do you want to take a breath together? I would love that. What okay. Do I do? All right. Okay. Put your hand on your heart. Okay. And then put your other hand two inches below your navel. Put your feet on the ground. Close your eyes. Steady yourself. Take a deep breath through your nose. Hold it at the top. Open your mouth and let it out with a ha. Uh. One more time. Wow. I'm sending my guides of the highest good and of the highest sovereignty to protect Jeremy and his reviews and to know that he is always enough. Thank you for taking this time, Jeremy. I'm so grateful. Thank you. That was really, really beautiful. Thank you. Oh, yeah, of course. I'm so excited to have done this. Like you have no idea. It's just it's just a little wink from the universe that I'm going in the right direction. So I'm really grateful. Well, do you live in LA? Let's have lunch sometime. Demystified is a production of Studio Fest. If you're ready to make a micro budget feature, submit your film or screenplay now at filmfreeway.com slash studiofest. Demystified is a Studio Fest production presented by Movie Maker. This episode was narrated and edited by me, Jake Bowen. It was conceived and recorded by Jess Jacklin, Charles Beale, and Jake Bowen. The theme song was composed by Patrick Patrikios. Other tracks used under Creative Commons licenses. To hear future episodes of Demystified, go to moviemaker.com or visit studiofest.com, where you can also learn more about Studio Fest and subscribe to the show.